Hello and welcome to Circle One. We're very excited to have an awesome guest here today. My name is John Swiston. I'll be your host. And I'm Jeff Swiston, brought to you by Nepotism. Oh boy, very excited <laughs> for this one. Uh, this one uh, is, is one I've looked forward to for quite some time. And Jeff, we're so uh, honored that you agreed to join us on the show and accept this invitation. Um, and, uh, you know, a little bit of intro uh, and background information on the show. Obviously, we are very interested in discussing brand, strategy, communications, marketing, advertising, those things here at Oxesis. Um, and so what we've been doing is, is rolling out a few different types of episodes. So uh, we've done panel conversations where we get a few people from a few different interests, uh, industries, sorry, uh, levels of experience uh, and, and backgrounds. Uh, then we've also got IC episodes. So we've got a number of independent contractors we engage with on an ongoing basis. Uh, and so we get those independent contractors together on a recurring basis. They come on uh, several episodes uh, and we, we talk high level. Uh, and then we're hoping to do some profiles. And so this is actually our first profile episode. Uh, I'm, I'm incredibly honored to, to have it be you uh, as the first profile. And so for a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, I'd like to turn things over to you and give you a little bit of uh, time to fill the audience in as to uh, your background, some of the really amazing roles that you've held with some incredible organizations, uh, and uh, perhaps a bit of insight into your day-to-day. -day. Well, that would be great. Well, first off, thanks for having me on in this segment. Hope, I know it's going to go well. We'll have a great uh, banter for sure. Yeah, my career, the thread has been business communications throughout and delivered in somewhat of a you know consulting framework, and that's continued to this day. was lucky enough to start in Toronto with them when they purchased an existing business, turned it into Interbrand Canada after a time. And that vaulted me to eventually become a CMO of Interbrand globally and to get a mutual benefit out of it. I'd come with a lot of structure from traditional management consulting for processes and Interbrand didn't have that uh, at that time. So I spent a good two, three years sort of buttoning down their own brand and their own methodologies and worked on some exciting stuff. Uh, not only client work, like rebranding re the Tampa Bay Rays, you know, a baseball team to working with Ralph Lauren to whatever. I was doing client work, but I was also in charge of Interbrand's brand. Um, and we grew the business significantly over six years. Um, I then followed my boss, who was CEO of Interbrand to DDB Worldwide, which is, you know, the, in the top three or four uh, largest ad agencies in the world by revenue. Mm -hmm. And that's a bad way to really think about an ad agency. Uh, they were more uh, excited about being recognized as like the second most awarded ad agency for its creativity. So over 11 years, uh, I commuted to New York from Canada every second week for 11 years um, and traveled other parts of the globe working for these. Uh, the parent company was Omnicom, so working for two of Omnicom's companies. And uh, you know, you just couldn't have asked for a better experience, uh, uh, greater challenges and, and wonderful people and clients to work with. And then about eight years ago, I, I was kind of getting sick of that travel, to tell you the truth. You know, it's, uh, it's a younger person's game. Not that I was ancient, but it, it, it really weighed on you. Um, and I have a, you know, I'm in a blended family. We have uh, not those complexities. We just have a richness to our lives and being on the road all the time wasn't the, the smartest choice. So eight years ago, I just opened up my own shingle. I've never had a payroll. It's just me. And 80% of my work has actually been advising consultancies and agencies on their own businesses and brands. And sure, I do other work. I, I, you know, I love to get a CPG client. Uh, they're tons of fun, a financial services, a tech startup. I've had smatterings of all that. Um, mm. But my uh, core has been helping you know, law firms, accounting firms, consultancies position themselves because I actually think professional services is the hardest industry to brand. Yes, and that's something interesting where, uh, you know, I think we've got quite a bit of alignment. We've definitely pursued uh, assisting and supporting professional services firms. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm really curious to hear um, where you see uh, that going in the future, the manner in which that support is provided, and especially given your background um, and obviously the marketing, the communications and the creative piece, uh, I'm really curious uh, to ask you uh, what you think collaboration looks like. So you've obviously done a lot of collaborative and teamwork uh, it, it, with some of the largest firms in the world when it comes to, you know, creative support for, for firms. 
what does collaboration look like when physical interaction is limited? So love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, it's, you know, it's funny. Um, uh, anyone who gets to know me loves that I, uh, or appreciates that I love getting up in front of a whiteboard in front of a fairly intimate room of six to eight people, a team around solving a problem, largely solving a problem through some form of business communications. So, you know, right now we've, we've lost that ability. Uh, though technology does, uh, you know, can help, and there were already tools and stuff in place uh, to deal with this. But I've been, uh, over the last three months, probably had three uh, association chats within my industry with um, uh, the American Marketing Association Canadian chapter, uh, the Institute of Communication Agencies, and RGD, the Registered Graphic Designers. And just this week, um, I was the guest on a Tuesday um, 6 p.m. cocktail call with 15 agency leads, um, leaders with RGD. And I, we spoke on this topic, you know, so they're not big agencies. I think big agencies have been rocked by this more than uh, mid to small, the nimbler ones who um, have always dealt with the change. Whereas a DDB that has 20,000 people, my CEO always used to say, this is like trying to you know, steer a super tanker. You're not going to get this thing to move. Mm -hmm. So they've experienced more upheaval. Um, they've got certainly more office space. They've certainly got more employees. Uh, they've got more um, rigidness as to how they like to work. Um, and they've had layoffs and furloughs. And the companies, the smaller ones that I've been talking to, the agencies that um, you know, have, have been nimble for some time or just decided that growth for growth's sake was not their business goal, um, you know, they've been able to maintain their payroll. Um, you know, the margins are down. Some of them have lost big clients and big work. Um, that's been the nature of the game. They're picking up stuff they wouldn't otherwise have done. And the 15 agency leads which uh, that I spoke to on um, Tuesday, they were great to share with me that they've been doing this for six, eight weeks. So I was like the eighth guest coming in and that there was a little bit more bullishness coming on. But we began then to speak about well, how are you going to work going forward? They were talking about their leases. You know, are they going to, one guy just had to re-up his lease. And the, in this time, believe it or not, the landlord jacked at 25%. Oof. And so, ouch, you know, yeah. like how do you, get, how do you maintain, um, you know, your operations under that? So a lot were quite happy to never go back to a shared physical space. Now we're talking agencies of, you know, 15 to 25 to 35 people. So that's doable once in a while they'll rent something and they'll congregate and come together when, you know, groups of that size are allowed to do so. Um, but collaboration and cr uh, creativity are going to be challenged now because mm -hmm. it's, it's always in that face to face that you have more insights come about because you're reading the whites of other people's eyes. You're seeing their, how they emotionally react to things. And of course, once again, technology allows, but doesn't allow in the same way. On the same token, I thought our industry was doing uh, was a little addicted to travel, a little addicted to going to clients, a little addicted to billing for everything that maybe didn't need to be done face to face. So if we go back to a new normal, um, perhaps the new normal is going to be a lot more sensible about what can be done remotely and what can, what needs to be done in person. Awesome. That's definitely something that we've thought we'd see in a lot of industries. So it's interesting to get your take when it comes to, uh, you know, the agency world and the, the ad world. Um, you had mentioned, uh, you know, just your own kind of take on that, especially, you know, in our kind of uh, uh, communications environment in Canada, obviously, there's some hot spots, and you've chosen to obviously move away from that physically speaking. Um, have, how have you found delivering your services and, and servicing your clients? Um, kind of uh, regardless of the current state of things and the current change right. that we're going through. Uh, but given the fact that you kind of chose to go against the grain and move away from Toronto and, and set up shop somewhere else, how did you find uh, uh, keeping in the game and staying competitive in, in the midst of that change? You know, I could have done that transition a whole lot better. I could have done it uh, and even leaving DDB, I sort of left with the idea. I left like after the, the Cannes Lions Festival in um, June, you know, which was the big award show and award shows in the ad industry may be going away now based on all this, but, um, and I, I was kind of burnt out. Like I, I was 11 years in traveling all that time that I previously, previously mentioned. And I wasn't even thinking about transitioning and going, you know, I need to bring money in. I still got bills and, and all that stuff. Um, I wanted to take a sabbatical and that's what got me uh, to start writing my book that took years too. But that summer and fall 
um, I literally was on sabbatical, you know, and um, hadn't thought about maybe I should leave with an anchor client, you know, someone, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that that really wasn't uh, uh, well done by me. So it was a great learning. And the other one was about geography. So uh, within my circle and my, you know, Rolodex is strong, um, but everyone thought, well, Jeff's leaving DDB and he's going to Tremblant. He's already set up for life. He's you know, the guy's semi-retirement drifting into retirement. That was, I was 47. So that wasn't the case at all. Um, so I had to really build, I had to go out and, and work. Um, I could have done something that I'm going to tell the audience that you should be doing no matter what age you are is networking better. Um, so when I was, you know, it was great for Jeff Swiston to be on CNBC and, uh, you know, a, 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 a speak at a conference, be a keynote, but it wasn't because it was Jeff Swiston, it was because the DDB logo and the Interbrand logo at some point were behind me. So I had to spend years establishing my own self, um, and, and, uh, building, rebuilding that credibility. My, believe me, my, uh, CV and my work experience, of course, is always there to assist. But I think if you get an email, if you're a client, you get an email from Swiston Communications versus Leo Burnett, I think, you know, there's going to be some disparity to that. So I really had to work at um, building my own brand, making my own contacts again. And it would have been wiser for me in the early days to have been better about that. Um, so those are two things that happened. I, as I was saying to you, as we prepped for this, um, I'm, I'm more hopeful now given the situation in the world, that there'll be less geographic bias when it comes to selecting uh, any professional service provider, because I'm a professional service too. Excellent. Definitely something that we're hoping to see over here as well. You you uh, put forth some nuggets of wind, wisdom there under the, the pretense of advice. And I, I think that what we're seeing, we work with a lot of kind of junior uh, folks delivering service, uh, uh, you know, at all sorts of levels. Um, but something that we're definitely seeing is, is a very similar stories to the one that you're telling, but happening much, much earlier in people's careers. So I think that that uh, advice is something that people are looking for. And you also said something else uh, that might be the, you know, the grain of salt or the, the little bit of insight that a lot of uh, these folks might find value in. And you said years. It took you years to oh, yeah. kind of build things up. Do you have maybe a little bit more that you can expand upon? If there's viewers at home that are watching who've just recently gone out under their own shingle, like, um, yeah, there's, you know, even, and not even those who are just uh, starting out under their own shingle. Um, I've been advising uh, on these calls within the industry and the, you know, the, the clients that I do have currently that every professional service now has to rewrite its own narrative given the change in our times. Mm -hmm. And this has been a downtime for many, uh, you know, work uh, dried up or stalled largely in the communications industry. It's starting to, as I say, hopefully creep back up. And I had advised uh, everyone or when I was chatting with people to say, this is the time to, you know, really work on your own brand. Yeah. Because a communications agency or a management consultancy or systems integrator like yourself, um, you know, we're being evaluated on our brand all the time. But specifically in the communications industry, um, an agency's brand must be best practice. It must be, you know, like your own number one case study. And even myself, I beat myself. I'm not happy with my own website right now, you know, and then you could, but you can spend time churning and that, but it was great to hear uh, once again, on one of these calls, I think it was with the Institute of Communication Agencies, one agency lead put up his hand as I was talking and said, you know, we have been had downtime. We've got great talented people. So we said, let's revamp ourselves. And so he, he really uh, was, you know, ahead of what I was professing, but I profess rewrite your narrative because times have changed. It's not about a pandemic though. It's about a change in business, right? Um, uh, also think outside the box of just being a communications agency, a design agency, a branding agency, an ad firm. You've got so many good people. You've got obviously structure and discipline start helping your clients on business issues, not mm -hmm. just communication issues. Um, come to them every quarter with something about their business, you know, about a, a new product that you potentially thought that they should offer, um, a, a way of organizing themselves to work more efficiently with you so they can save money. Um, these are things that um, agencies need to be thinking about. And surprisingly, the one thing that uh, I thought I'd get pushback on in these discussions was they said, specialize, specialize, specialize. That doesn't mean we're only going to do, uh, you know, TV commercials for automotive companies. That's the wrong specialization. Find a niche, a neat, a neat USP that you can take out there just so you're not something to everyone. There's, um, 
kind of a panic these days within my industry that, you know, you got to keep the lights on, you got payroll, you, you got to pay for a lease, and you're not even occupying the building. It's terrible, right? Um, but if you begin just grabbing work for work's sake, I think that's going to not help you, you know, six months from now. Yeah, it might, it might seem like the savior right now. So I was surprised when I floated that one, because we're all, you know, still anxious about things that um, most of the agency folks totally agreed with that. So I, I was pretty happy that they took that thesis. Huh, well, I find that fascinating and the, the specialization versus generalization is uh, uh, probably a thread worth pulling on here, something that we're constantly combating with. Um, and I think probably when you're young, it can be very tempting to be all things to all people and just say yes to everything did you when you struck out on your own how did you grapple with that how were you able to to focus in and narrow in on those those projects that you really wanted to take on yeah so i was never an expert in tech financial yeah, i wasn't an expert in a specific industry except as you you know as i've been saying professional services and then i thought about where do i really lend value or where have i lent value in the past and what excites me that's kind of the nexus that you you want to get to even if you're starting out it's kind of think of it as two overlapping circles. You know, what excites me? What am I good at? Here's the sweet spot. And um, back to these conversations I was having, I was really happy to hear another agency said, it was painful, but we have chopped all of the fun stuff that we, that, you know, the fun work we like to do, hmm. but it wasn't really adding to our brand. It wasn't really adding to our bottom line. And because they went through this process um, in the last, uh, you know, three months and just said, what are our core services? And still core services to me are not your USP or you're not your, um, your differentiator or differentiators. I can't tell you, John, how many times I sat in Pricewaterhouse meetings or <laughs> Interbrand and DDB specifically and looking at our matrix, the industries we want to serve, the, the services yeah. we bring to them. And, you know, there's <laughs> in, the, in there, I, I, you know, I, I, hours, hundreds of hours of meetings on that. And then we go, how do we translate this into something that can live on our website or clients will understand? Yes. We've got our service wheel and now here's our service wheel. Yeah, I, I designed so many service wheels that I would see them in my sleep. <laughs> but you, should, you should be able to just come out and, and say the one thing you're good at. And you know what I'm, the one thing I'm good at is writing the most impactful brand story for a professional services firm that will cascade to internally and externally and that they can then go off and use some stuff that I don't know anything about. Google yeah. AdWords in the website. I, I don't drill down to that level. Yeah. But I can write a brand story that will blow people away and get everyone inside that business moving in the right direction. Uh, you know, it, the brand story doesn't save everything. Implementation of the brand story is uh, critical, uh, doubly critical in some cases. But that's my niche. And I was actually, I like to say, uh, when this all sort of hit, it was, I flew back from Toronto, Toronto on March 13th. I'd been there for six days, actually arrived on the previous Saturday or Sunday and watched, you know, our world sort of go down, yeah. uh, and, you know, from shaking hands on Monday to bumping elbows on Wednesday yeah. to say, we may, may never see you again. Um, I was working with the client on revamping their brand that week and they relaunched during this and they did it on a Zoom call and the feedback was fantastic because the employees were looking for a lift yeah, too, you know, yeah. darker days about three, three weeks a month ago. And they were just ecstatic to see that the company had invested in this, that there was enthusiasm, energy, there was new thinking. And I took them from, I actually rebranded them seven years ago. So this is the second time I worked with them and I've loved the progression. And, and, you know, so this is another thing. This is a professional services firm that says, Oh, we rebranded seven years ago. We don't have to do it for 10, 15. Yeah. No, you know, you've got to get the signals that, your message isn't resonating. So it doesn't matter the years that have gone by or the investment you made. If it has to be done, it has to be done. And I think for all professional services firms now, it, the brand needs to be redone. Totally. Well, it seems like obviously the, in the current state of things, there's there's a lot of uncertainty and transitional you know, you know, effects, all sorts of competing things happening. Uh, but that kind of seems kind of constant in business. There's always transition. There's always change. There's always risk and uncertainty. Um, it sounds like you're talking about admiring brands that are heroic and courageous that are going to do that rebrand when the writing's on the wall and follow through even in the midst of uh, potentially impending doom and all sorts of wild stuff. How do brands, regardless of size, find that courage? 
How, how do they show their clients and customers that they are heroic? I think strength of leadership, you know, it, it really has to come about. I'm, you know, uh, so I'm a one man shop. I couldn't even think about, so this client, uh, and I'm happy to mention them. I don't think they'd be upset. Bond brand loyalty, you know, about four or 500 people, um, just had the last six, seven years had grown. They were taking, they had a, this cool Mississauga campus and they were taking downtown uh, Toronto space just before this. They brought on uh, as president, uh, the former head of PricewaterhouseCoopers Consulting Worldwide. And so he's come in and, and Brian and I used to work together, Brian McLean, and he's working with Bob McDonald, who's the, was the CEO and is, I guess, moving to chairman. And I think they just went, you know, what can we do? You know, we're not going to be complacent. Um, and our, our clients need us, I think, was sort of the, 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 the anthem they took on. And that anthem then um, spreads to the employees. And there's always been this thing in brand culture. I just call it brand culture, be damned. Um, you know, who do you work on first? Because uh, there's quotes like, how do you expect uh, your employees to make customers or clients happy if they're not happy? So, okay, yeah. so do you first? focus on the employees first, or should you be customer centric? You know, I think sometimes the academic institutions just pick on something and also Harvard Business Review writes about it. You go, that's the way to go. Well, no, when you, you're a CEO of a business, um, you know, just share with the audience, prior to this, John showed me his dashboard of computer screens, you know, to <laughs> be doing these uh, Zoom sessions and, and putting them up on YouTube. Um, and that literally, what you've got in front of you is what a CEO has in front of him, but not from a technological standpoint, but yeah. okay, are, are my employees happy? Do I have enough operating cash flow over here? You know, they've got this dashboard that they don't literally have in front of them, but it's churning in their brain all the time. And they've got to make sense of it. And then Tom Peters said it years ago, and I, he did it from a consumer point of view, that uh, brands are sorting devices. Well, a brand is also a decision-making device for a CEO. Is this on brand or is this off brand? And when you're looking at that dashboard or having it in your head, uh, I would imagine the CEO in, in this case of, of Bond Brand Loyalty, Bob McDonald's going, okay, I've got to do something now. You know, we're in a crisis or, you know, business is probably contracting. What do I do? Well, we invested in the brand. We're going to follow through. We still think it makes sense. And we're going to move this style here and this style here. We've got to, it's like a, you know, running a 747. Okay, totally. here's the trim. You touch the trim and the speed and, you know, yeah, the yeah. starts doing this. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that is a, an experience that I think I'm all too familiar with it, given our size, scale, level of experience. But, um, you know, I, it's, it, it feels to me like you're you're totally onto something with the the idea of the dashboards. Like there's just the, all these signals and inputs and outputs, uh, in whether they're in front of you physically or tactile or in your mind, um, and you're you know you're pushing buttons and pulling levers all over the place. Uh, and kind of one of the premises or propositions that we've we've worked on here at Axesis is that uh, our our bed is kind of like the playing field is just leveling naturally. And so the small organization, the micro business even, and and the medium organization, um, all of a sudden has capabilities, functionality at their behest that, you know, just wasn't available to them in the past. Uh, And so you and I on the, on the prep call, we were talking about some of those, those hard things that small and medium agencies can be doing to, to pull through ahead uh, and we, we toyed with this idea that maybe that playing field is being leveled in some regard. What are you seeing in the marketplace? How are you, you feeling about that? Where do you think uh, the opportunities lie for, for folks who might be trying to kind of stake their claim right now? You know, it comes down to having that uniqueness. So as a brand guy, I'm always going to be touting that. I, and, and, and it's not even a brand guy. I think even if I was in operations or human resources, I'd always be thinking, what is the company's differentiator? And in you know, my industry, the, the differentiation is always talent. It, you know, technology is cool now. Um, mm-hmm. We've got a lot of shiny new toys and um, in the business communications industry. Um, but it's still always going to be about creativity Uh, meshed with strategy Mm -hmm. Um, creativity for creativity's sake is art and you know that doesn't necessarily apply itself in a commercial world you've got to have that strategic notion so I think if I was to be advising and I am any company uh, it's a tough one so if you get uh, let let me put it this way funny story uh, and there's two branches to it last year a brand asked me to evaluate 30 mid-size ad agencies to see if uh, they you know which ones would be best 
from a chemistry standpoint, then they would go through an RFP process mm -hmm. with a smaller, smaller number. And uh, side story, because I, 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 this talks to differentiation. When I went on the 30 sites, and I don't know if you've seen this in, um, in your travels, but in the people section of those agencies, you know, they've got uh, chief creative officer and, uh, mm -hmm. this, and then they've got the office dog. And there's literally a photo of the office dog. And 22 of the 30 agencies I visited had an office dog. Wow. And I went, there's no differentiation. You know, that's so goofy. <laughs> where, where did this special. Office, yeah, where did this office dog thing come from? And why jump on the bandwagon of that? Um, but the side story to that, too, is when I work with um, uh, creative agencies, consultancies, any professional services firm, we always talk about, you know, talent is the biggest differentiator. However, back to that, those 30 firms, they all had great people. So mm -hmm. what do you say? We've got the greatest people. You can't make that claim. You can't do that at all. So to me, it's finding about five things, turning it into a powerful fist and, you know, punching the audience in the face with it three times. So they remember that this thing is important to us and we do it well. This is this, 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 and this, because it's not just the one thing. Awesome. Could you maybe provide a few examples of what those, those three things that somebody might drill home uh to to prospects or clients like for for me uh and our firm it's high service like high touch high service we just we're always there and always supportive for our clients what are the other types of things that you you see as as worth drilling in that's a, that's a really good one i'm glad you're emphasizing that i worked with a uh, uh, performance marketing uh agency called pmg which has just been out of uh, texas shooting the lights out like uh, any awards, growth, you know, Google's wanted to buy them, Omnicom, WPP wanted to buy them. Uh, the CEO had previously sold a company, didn't like the experience of being merged in. So he's fiercely independent. And he's high touch too, um, in terms of clients. And I saw it, I happened to be there on uh, over Black Friday and Cyber Monday working with them. And so they're all about like, they're kind of the irritant guys, if you want to put it this way. They're the guys that when you, uh, in the previous days, Google, I want to go to Cancun. And then for the next, you know, 10 days, you got all these push ads coming at you. Well, they're sort of responsible for that mm -hmm. stuff. But I watched them work with their travel companies, their retail uh, clients, and they had an amazing uh, NASCAR slide of clients. I watched from Friday into Monday, and they actually were bringing um, client uh, folks into their office and they and uh, so it'd be one person from PMG, one person from the client, and they're working there and looking at literally the, the dashboards and going, what, how are the sales going doing that? And I couldn't believe like how dedicated these people were. Well, they knew it's just a huge spike in sales for their clients and, and, and required to do it. So high touch is a good one. Um, one uh, real tactile one that needs to come up is no fluffy case studies. If you're going to put anything up on your website or put it into a proposal or make any claim about it, it's got to be quantifiable or uh, show up with a real weighty um, testimonial from your client. Yeah. That, you know, you know maybe they're, they're not able to quantify, uh, you know, what you provided to them in a, the shorter term, or maybe it plays out longer, or they don't want to make a number claim, but, but have the VP of something say, Working with these guys was awesome for these two or three reasons. That's always the most powerful thing. Um, methodology and process, uh, you know, we end up all gravitating to the mean, you know, in consulting. We have our four stages, you know, discovery, you know, problem, so solution, continuous improvement. Um, but underneath that, you can have uh, very interesting ways of working uh, together. So that's important. But funny, you know, when it comes down to, and I've done studies on this myself and read all the studies, the biggest thing that uh, a client will decide on in selecting anything almost uh, is chemistry. So in the process of acquiring a client, how do you match up? You know, it's a, it's a dating uh, yeah. thing, you know? And, and sometimes, you know, you're concerned, oh my God, do I have broccoli in my teeth? And, you know, like, <laughs> You just, you just have to be, you know, yourself. Yeah. Uh, that's what they're purchasing. They almost take it for granted, clients, that you've got all that other stuff underneath, right? That you've, you know, you've got the experience, you've got the, the uh, process and methodologies, uh, you know, but they want to see, can I work with this person? Can, can I, on a day-to-day -day basis, can we measure up, mesh up, uh, and, and collaborate? Hmm. That is very, I think, uh, 
insightful advice and very valuable advice, especially as, as I mentioned, there's a lot of people I think who are, who are going through that career transition, striking out on their own, maybe earlier than it, it happened typically in professional life. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of people who are, you know, 22 to 28, who've got, you know, between four and uh, 10 years of professional experience who just like, yep, it's, it's my turn. I'm going to start my own thing. To hear you say the chemistry thing, I think is uh, uh, probably empowering um, to them, I, I hope. Uh, and I hope it, it helps them realize that, yeah, it takes time. Because just like in life, you don't develop chemistry with everybody. Um, yeah. and, and there are those special people in your life that, that you do find a special spark with. I wonder, Jeff, if, if it's okay. There actually are a few of those people watching uh, in our audience here today live. Uh, and they've they've loved the conversation so far as the feedback that they're giving me in the chat. Uh, and Great. maybe I'll just read a few of the comments to you. And there are a few questions, if you wouldn't mind fielding some of them. Only if they're really good questions. <laughs> I'll try and filter out as best as I can. But with all <laughs> no. the knobs and levers in front of me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. So uh, first, great insights. So specialize on market segments and a USP and be disciplined in saying no to work that doesn't push your expertise in that domain, question mark? That's exactly right. I think that that's uh, whoever did that. That's just the formula right there. Uh, and as I say, I know it's tough in these times um, to say no to any type of work, right? Um, but find a way to if you get that client, if you get a foot in the door and it's a project that's tangentially, you know, uh, good to you, try to move it, uh, move them through trust and chemistry to what you do do well, because they're going to uh, perhaps respect that too. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same token, just don't take work for the sake of work. And I know that's really hard to counsel because we all have bills and, and uh, overhead and issues. Um, but, but try to hold the line on that as much as possible. Awesome. Okay, great advice there. Uh, next, we've got somebody with that specialist uh, generalist question. I absolutely struggle with whether to specialize or generalize in my domain. In today's world, especially in marketing, it's easy to be something to everyone. Um, and so I, I, I think this, this person is following a very kind of similar uh, path as you. He, he describes himself as a minimalist, uh, but who really is interested in branding and marketing and, and supporting clients. Um, I don't know if there's a question there, but any advice for somebody who's in, in I think this person is 20, 20 years old and striking out okay. on their own. Wow. Um, well, and the other thing I remember, my resume was pretty spotty in my, you know, four years here, two years there, where everyone was, you know, especially in Winnipeg, which was so conservative, you got to do 20 years at Great West Life and you know that. Yeah. So I you know, applaud that the, the world has gone to more of this experimentation. Uh, for the the twenty year old uh, in specialization versus generalization, uh, I'm going to put on an old man cap right now and say I don't think I could buy you as a generalist. And I and I'm sorry, I'm going to uh, poop on it a bit because in twenty years, what experiences have you got? But if you tell me as a twenty year old, this yeah. has been my one or two specific interests, and I'm passionate about it, well then I'll buy you more as a specialist in that, and someone professing to know a little bit of everything. Hmm. That's interesting. We've, we've definitely, we've engaged with this individual before a few times, uh, uh and, and benefited greatly from their services. Uh, and it's, it's been after a couple of years that we're exploring some general, more general services, but definitely this person is like in two or three very specific domains, like a go-to person for us. And it's like, I just know, like they know this specific, uh, niche area of the service so well. So great. Great advice for that individual. Um, next, we've got somebody who's who's very similar and, and venturing into the e-commerce space. Uh, and I think they've split this question ac across two comments. Okay, my business offers e-commerce development services to two types of clients, established businesses looking to add e-commerce and established e-commerce businesses looking to accelerate. Very different work between two, two segments. Are we spreading ourselves too thin? That's uh, interesting. And of course, I'm not a, a super techie um, by, by any stretch, um, but I like that. I like that, that there is, um, that you're working with companies at two different times in their growth. Um, so I don't know enough to answer the question specifically, but my gut is telling me that if you are able to service both segments uh, to the same degree of quality and satisfaction, go for it. 
But if you feel you're stronger in one area and getting feedback from clients that way, then focus. But I, I kind of like the, the two growth segments, right? Because it, it means you've got a longer tail of client, you've got mm-hmm. a longer relationship. Um, and I don't see those two things as mutually exclusive. But once again, I'm, I'm not into the depth of that work. I think that's very fitting advice, know, knowing a little bit more about what they're up to. And I think that's something that they'll be able to take to the bank, I think. Um, okay. they, they're, they're probably in a very similar position as, as I am as well, wondering, you know, what stage of growth I should be focusing on in terms of my clients. So uh, I think that, that, uh, that that'll be very helpful to them. And we're, we're getting the comments roll in as well. Thank you for the insight. Great advice. Uh, and then I think we've got one more uh, question. It looks like it's a continued question, so I'll read the first part, and then I'm, I think the second part is coming in. Um, uh, this one comes from a creative strat- strategist, somebody who's very interested in, in brand voice um, and, and really specializes as a writer. Um, mm. And this is Chris. He says, what's your stance on the way that brands are gaining lots on in-house capability? It seems to have sparked a shift in agencies to do more consulting. In my experience, cutting your teeth as a young creative is becoming more appealing in-house when you can spend a lot of time with the brand. And I think that that's the question in there. Uh, What's your stance? I get exactly exactly what that person is saying. So there, uh, and I wrote a huge paper on this. It's uh, on my website, uh, kind of the future of advertising. And it looked at actually four segments. So there's the traditional agency, uh, there's the in-house, there's the consultancy because um, uh, uh, Deloitte Digital, you know, uh, Accenture, they're all coming into the, what had been the advertising, uh, traditional advertising space. Uh, and then there's a fourth one, which is actually uh, big tech, Google, Facebook, um, with what's going on there. Yeah. So this is a crazy ecosystem now where the clients are confused as to where to go to, because uh, Facebook and, and Google are saying, come straight to us, you know, and we'll promote your brand digitally like crazy. You don't need to go to an agency or a consultancy and you can, you know, cut down on your, your in-house if you have it. Fact is any model can work. And this was even uh, going on in my uh, traditional management consulting days in terms of the the fight about whether or not you have a strategy department within your business. There used to be a strategic planning department in most of the fortune 1000. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the uh, McKinsey's and that said, Hey, you don't need to, to spend on that internal um budget you can just engage us because the number one thing that any consultant brings is not a skill set in writing or in e-commerce or anything it's objectivity to the business so that's been the big division between in-house um creative services uh and uh external that objectivity is not there um i even saw it once uh at ddb they had anheuser-busch which became uh ab InBev. well i I was there i got bought up by the dutch concern or whatever and you know so ddb did all those iconic ads what's up the the clydesdale courses all the way for for budweiser and we would put a a team of like 150 people would literally be ddb people but they would be in-house at the beer company Mm -hmm. and they they'd lose their objectivity. They became more the beer company employee than the DDB employee. Mm. So that lost some spark. And actually DDB ended up walking away from the business because we, we um, there was a lot of issues, but was, one of them was kind of mistreatment from these big brands. So in-house, what I'll say is the benefit is yes, you get complete, uh, completely immersed in, in one brand. And that was never attractive to me as a whatever you'd call me, a strategist or a creative or a writer, I don't know exactly what I am. I was always interested in variety. Mm -hmm. So if I got put on one account, it never happened to me, but if I got put on one account for two years, I'd probably go stir crazy. Uh, Because it's so neat when you're working on a half dozen accounts or bouncing in and out, how you get a twig of idea from this one that can be applied to that one, not stolen, but a best practice, a a cool spark comes. Um, It's just the way I work, where someone might just, I just want to work on, Coca-Cola, you know, it, it could yeah. be that way. What about that objectivity from a third-party service provider perspective? Do you think when when you are uh, servicing multiple different accounts and like uh, backing, bouncing back and forth between them, do you think you're better able to maintain that objectivity when you're more often able to look at things with fresh eyes as opposed to focusing in on, on one account? Well, you don't want to get schizophrenic. You got to understand that you're from this agency or this business. And then you can serve them in that way. But if all of a sudden you become partial to one, 
Mm -hmm. I'm probably going to impact uh, the work and the relationship you do on the other. And it's difficult to handle multiple accounts. So I was always in a catbird seat where, you know, I, I didn't have to grunt out 80 hours a week on, on a client. I was going into the cool meetings and, and throwing my two cents around. Um, so it really depends on how you like to work. You know, are, 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 are you a deep and rich thinker? Are you a creative and up here thinker? So you can do that smattering. And I, I think it really comes down to uh, individual skills and wants and needs. Excellent. Fantastic stuff. And the, the audience is echoing the, the sentiment as well. Uh, another just uh, reply to the, to the response that you gave. Great insight. It really illustrates, illustrates the needs for brands to support in-house with agency objectivity. And uh, so that's interesting. Like, how, how functional can that combination be? Have you seen real success stories with, with in-house and, and outside teams working well together? It, it's it's happening more and more. So there's got to be this mutual respect now. Uh, you know, Madison Avenue, the traditional players were have been very slow to change, which is ironic considering they're all about differentiation, creativity, and it's supposed to be innovation. Uh, they were, you know, the time I was there, uh, six years, 2006 to 11 or whatever, um, was probably the most frustrating time for me in the industry to t try to turn that super tanker uh, or to help, you know, turn that super tanker, which didn't happen. And I thought we were moving way too slow. Um, and I saw our lunch was going to get eaten by consultancies. And so there, there, there has been that struggle, but there's been neat models. So a guy, Peter McGinnis, he, he ran DDB Chicago. I didn't know Peter well, but it had been in a handful of meetings with him. He got frustrated too. And he split and he went to Chobani, the uh, uh, Greek yogurt company, which was just fantastic. The segment on the CEO on 60 Minutes was amazing if you go and, and want to go Google that. So Peter became their CMO. And I don't know if he was just pissed off with Madison Avenue, but he brought everything in house and has created what people respect to be one of the best agencies, regardless, even though it's got one client and that's Giovanni Yogurt. Hmm. Um, so he just, he just saw that that's the way he wanted to control it. And, and, you know, there's a lot of games between big agencies and big brands about billing and procurement, you know, when you go in to try to win McDonald's business or Volkswagen business, you're assessed through their procurement department more mm -hmm. so than their, you know, marketing department. And, and these documents are like this that you have to satisfy. And they're the same documents that the Xerox repairman has to provide, you know, so you feel kind of relegated to this yeah. terrible role. Uh, and it happens a lot in tech, but uh, yeah, anyway, I'm now I'm venting. <laughs> <laughs> ah, there's a time and place for it, I think. Uh... And it's, it's nice to, to be able to have these discussions and, and get cathartic about some of those things. And, and also, I think there's a lot of value to be found there in, in the discussion of, the, of those kind of um, issues and situations. Now, you know, we've, we've spoken with the audience. We've heard a lot uh, from you. Um, and, you know, I, I just want to kind of transition and shift gears for a moment and get a bit more specific about what you're up to these days. Um, and just start out by saying, obviously, you've got uh, a very interesting storied a career full of numerous successes and, and working with some of the bigger players in the industry. Uh, but most recently, uh, as you alluded to at the top of the show, you've, you've explored writing more fully uh, and in particular book writing. And so uh, for the audience at home, Jeff uh, recently released a book uh, called Ma why, sorry, called why marketing works. Um, and I've read it personally. I was gifted a copy. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, and it has helped me greatly. I found it extremely insightful, um, and I guess I wasn't the only one because uh, recently it's hit number one in the advertising category on Amazon, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I did that you know, about this time last year, um, and, and though that sounds impressive and I do tout it, it was, it was up at number one for about a nanosecond. <laughs> <laughs> it did it, man. You did it. <laughs> it did it. Um, and what's interesting is uh, it also did well in the category of business leadership, which is, uh, as I'm learning more and more through writing, um, that's what people, it's the category, the most looked at, at category when people are looking at business books is, is leadership. So, you know, to uh, the session, which was all about communications leadership, I found that interesting. But yeah, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of books. At, at, at Interbrand, I did like this brand glossary, which was so cool. Wow. Uh, yeah, at the, uh, and this is ancient now, this is like 2007, but it was cool. It came out in five different languages too. So this is the French version, which was really neat. And this was kind of where I first cut my teeth on it, even though I had helped with other books. Here's my CEO from DDB's book, um, you know, that I helped shepherd through. We had a, a ghostwriter, but I, I 
get everything else on it. And, and I got intrigued with books right from the very beginning. This is a great one still from uh, Andrea Mandel Campbell, who was, yes. uh, you know, why Mexicans won't drink Molson or don't uh, drink Molson. And so I was quoted in this and it really started to get me thinking. I've always been a voracious reader. I wasn't a, very, a great academic. It took to when I could select my own books to read that I became a voracious reader. Um, love military history, love business books, and would just consume everything. I probably read over 500 marketing and branding books. And what I found was it became the law of diminishing returns. And that's okay. You know, people were saying the same things and citing the same brands, but got sick of hearing about McDonald's and Apple and stuff, and even uh, recently Airbnb and Uber. Um, so what the catalyst for uh, this book, and once again, it's it's a lot thinner than most because I don't think we have to be verbose these days. And we're living in a world where attention spans, unless you're watching the Tiger King for the third time, your attention <laughs> span is not going to be there. Um, but the catalyst for this was actually, uh, so I live in Montreal, Blanc, Quebec, and, and uh, seven, eight years ago, it took a long time for this book to come to market. Um, I walked into the local farmer's market. Um, begrudgingly my wife on a you know saturday or sunday whatever it was said we're going to the market i'm like i'd rather be in the golf course or a hike or something and i walked in and all five of my senses were engaged you know here on this transformed civic parking lot uh were rows of stalls you know with um the stuff we require and the luxuries we desire and you know you saw the fanfare between uh vendor and consumer you saw sampling going on you saw two for ones being offered you saw a regular customer getting a freebie. Um, you start bartering, you know, like, oh, I'll take two pies for the, you know, you just, everything, smell was engaged. Everything was tactile, it was real. And I just started thinking about marketing as a word. And uh, interestingly enough, in one of the episodes of Mad Men, um, Betty Draper, Don's wife, is uh, putting together a dinner party. And uh, the guests go, wow, this is a fabulous spread. And she gives credit to uh, her maid or, or housekeeper, um, well, she did the marketing. And I went, she did the marketing. So we prolonged <laughs> this term marketing. Marketing meant shopping. Yeah. You know, marketing going to the grocery store. and But we as an industry have taken over the word and, and made it the practice of uh, trying to convince people to buy. So I found all that fascinating. So instead of going to and dredging the same well, I went back 300 years. I found a poem about going to market that basically was a, a textbook for how to sell something. Hmm. Uh, and it's a poem from like, I don't know, I like forget now, the 17th century. And there were neater stories. I tell the story of You Need a Biscuit, the first $1 million ad campaign about 1903. And, you know, Unita was a fun name, You Need a Biscuit, and how they did a teaser campaign, the first teaser campaign, Do You Know? And they would put this on billboards all across America. Do you know you need a biscuit? They'd add on to it. Do you, and, and it was just amazing. So all these cool stories. How did in, in the mid-century? Why did every house have a you know a piano in the living room, and why? How did we have to think that to show success we needed a baby grand or a grand piano in our living room that no one ever touched and just sat there collecting dust and cost a ton of money? Like who convinced people to buy that on mass? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it was other people. It was basically peers. You know, it was a sign of success. It was like having a bookshelf of, of nice books or the bar cart in the room, the mid century, those were all things that signaled your success. And uh, that was what those marketers preyed upon. Awesome. It's uh, it's super cool to hear you expand on some of those stories. Uh, the Unita uh, story from your book is especially one of my favorites. Uh, and I'll just say it. I, like, I want to do that. I want, <laughs> I want to just start buying bus billboards and start with cryptic messages on them and, and evolve them and, and, uh, I hope that we see some more playful stuff as we come out of this period of intense transition. I, I hope we're seeing a lot of people try a lot of new things. It's going to be tough for marketers. I, I was I spoke about a month ago about uh, how there have been three different types of messages through the last three months. The first was your sort of public service announcements, almost your, you know, your wartime government things about wash your hands and, and stay inside and stay away from people. Then you had that next round, um, which was brands saying, we're here for you. Uh, car companies pushing back payments, banks trying to be more flexible. Uh, and then you got into this, and then I, I pitched one on this third uh, sort of thesis, which was the thank you stuff that came out, right? Thanking everyone, thanking. And what that trained brands to do quickly in a three month period was lose any notion of segmentation of an audience. 
all brands have been doing is communicating one message to one mass. So to your point, it'll be interesting when we start feeling um, more positive about things, both health and health of economy, how brands will begin to re-engage in segmentation and have more specific messages for more specific groups. Um, but we're still not seeing it. It's still sort of that globular mass of stuff going out now. Hmm. Well, very much looking forward to it. Um, uh, we've got we've got a couple more questions rolling in, and I think I'll just apologize to the to the viewers at home. Uh, we are very hopeful that there are a few guests that we get to have back uh, on the show, and I'd love to maybe you know circle back with you in three four months, Jeff. Uh, as you know, obviously we'll, we'll we'll start seeing you know maybe some of these changes that we're talking about roll out, uh, and so it'd be fascinating to circle back with you to see how things are doing, your thoughts on where things have been and where things are going. Um, and then at that point, maybe we can incorporate some of these uh, last questions that are coming in. There's a few specific ones that I think would be really interesting uh, to touch on you there. Um, and I'll take this moment. I'd like to to uh, transition yet again into some of the more current stuff that you're up to. Um, yeah. And there were two uh, activities that you're involved in currently that I, I'd love to give you an opportunity to speak about. The first being uh, offering your own services as a writer, I think, is something that you're really getting into. Uh, that sounds incredibly appealing to me and I'm probably to a lot of other uh, founders, business owners, uh, and, and it, leaders of business of all sizes. Um, and then also I believe that you've got a webinar coming up with some pretty notable individuals. So I'll, I'll turn it to you to, to let us know about those. So yeah, it was, you know, as I said, I've marshaled a lot of books to, to market when you had a budget with a big company against with you or behind you. And then doing my own book was quite the education. And you know, it, it's, it's brave to write a book. Um, and I'm not patting myself on the back. I've only done one of my own books, but some people put out multiple books and I'm just amazed at their resiliency because uh, you have to have a thick skin. First off, you know, it starts conceptually. Uh, you know, do I have something interesting to say as a thought leader and why am I doing this? And um, so I, I'm beginning to work with people and marshalling their concept, you know, all the way to the shelf, including the marketing. So I've, I have set up this end to end service. I don't do publishing. I advise on publishing because it is confusing. It's still insular. Um, it's cliquish. So if you're trying to go to a traditional publisher, it's real tough. If you try mm -hmm. to get an agent, that's tough. But now there's other realms, right? There's self-publishing. I do fun short stories on Amazon. I just upload a Word document and it's up there and it's available for 99 cents. So that you, you can do that. Or you can go to assisted self-publishing um, too. The bottom line across all of that is the world has always wanted good content. And now the world needs content that contextualizes our new world. And um, there's less, there's gatekeepers in this process. There's stumbling blocks, but there's ways to get through it. But it starts with why am I writing this book? And the worst piece of advice I got, which is this universally acclaimed one is write the book you would want to read. Mm. Uh, it, it's utter, I'm going to swear on your, your video. <laughs> it's, it's, it's BS. Um, it totally is. So I, I spent years after that catalyst of being in that market, I wrote a book that was also kind of a cathartic thing. Like, uh, Peter Chobani bringing everything in house because he was pissed off with Madison Avenue. I, I kind of wrote a, tom, a tome uh, that was weighty and the economist laden words. And, uh, you know, it was just brutal. It wasn't me, but it was a rant and something I had to get out because I was pissed off with a bunch of things in our industry, how we award ourselves too much and pat ourselves on the back. So it's going on all these rants. And I won a publishing contest and it wasn't probably for the strength of the manuscript. Hmm. Uh, even though they said it was strength of the marketing, they went, well, we could probably sell a few books with this guy's name on it because he came from this industry. So, you know, if I had published what I had actually published, it would have been three times this, it would have been bigger and no one would have read it. And it, mm -hmm. it, yes, it would have been the book I wanted to read, but as my publisher told me, maybe only one other person would want to read it. So they did a great job of channeling this through the process of saying, you got to think about your audience in mind and what you want them to take away. So I really learned from them. They're great people. I continue to work with them. So I ask three questions now as I conceptualize a book. Why are you writing it? What, do you, what three things do you want people to take away once they've closed the, the book? And what are your terms of success in writing this? Because I can tell you, you don't write a book to make money on the book. You, you, sales of this, a good business book sells 5,000 copies. That's a good, 5,000 copies? Yeah. Think of the labor you put into this, yeah. you know, because you're making you know, X amount on this, there's other people taking chunks of the, the book sales. 
Yeah, and hundreds so, of hours of your time, probably. Hundreds. Of, yeah. So it, you yeah. know, to me, it, I, I do not want to um, uh, diminish this, but I consider it, you know, a big brochure. It demonstrates my thinking. It demonstrates my ability to write. And when I was getting advanced praise from very uh, influential people, David Aker from the Haas School of Business and this and that, he said, it's not only the content, but it was the, the storytelling aspect of Jeff's writing. So that, that's what really buoyed me in this whole thing. So now I offer this service. I'm signed with um, Gotham Ghostwriters out of New York. You know, I'm one of 2,000 on their list, but I get sent these projects to work on. And to sign with Gotham, you, you've got to be good. So I like that. They've worked with five U.S. presidents. You know, they've done, it's, it's really neat. Now, uh, you, um, you mentioned it just like a half hour before we had, uh, came on for the chat. Um, there's um, Vayner uh, Media, and it's Gary Vaynerchuk, this guy who's, you know, huge in my industry. I heard of him. Great. Yeah, great story. <laughs> uh, you know, Google him, um, and they call him Gary V. They, they, they chop his name down to V-E-E because the Vaynerchuk is tough, like Swiston. It's a tough name to, to get across. But, um, you know, Gary's put out five books, and he professes he's never read one. He jokes about that. But he's put out five books because he's had an amazing career. His family started like in the wine business. Um, and I mean, just having a few shops in New Jersey, I'm, I'm kind of paraphrasing or not getting this exactly right. And in the early two, two, uh, early part of this century, him and his brother started looking at, well, how do we grow this business? So they went online and they learned everything about YouTube and that next thing, you know, Gary's quite a personality he's spoken everywhere and he's just gotten better at his craft. And he's quite, you know, blunt and crass, he'll swear yes. a lot. He's, he's imparting this message. And, you know, they grew that business from, I don't know, 12 million to 60 million by taking it online. And those learnings that him and his brother had around how to deal with social media and, and just, you know, new media and everything that was cropping up said, well, why don't we open a media business? And just prior to this, they took huge space in uh, the Naval Yards, the Hudson Naval Yards in um, uh, Manhattan. It, it, his media business is huge. So I'm, I'm happy to announce on June 23rd, um, I'm doing a a five hour session with Gary, a few of his people. It's a paid for thing. I think I was just mentioning it to you. I'm, I'm still new to this too, that there's uh, only 30 people are, are gonna be allowed to attend, pay for and attend this thing. And it's on getting your book as they call it from you know pen to market. Hmm. Uh, so really excited to be working with uh, Gary's group. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get a few takers out of this that people will want to write a book at this time. I think there's actually been no better time to write a book. I couldn't have written, written a book in the last three months. I was too scattered, too anxious to, you know, I, I'm not a futurist. I couldn't profess to know where the, the world was going. But I think right now it's a really cool time. And I was just working with a uh, executive search exec, uh, guy from big, big firm, the big brand in that industry, who's trying to predict or show that finding a career now, um, uh, finding a position, going about that now is going to be entirely different. And it's not because of social distancing or anything like that. Uh, it's for a whole bunch of other reasons. So mm -hmm. I took his manuscript and cleaned it up and really excited for how that book uh, is responded to. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I'm uh, uh, looking forward to hearing about how the uh, seminar, the webinar goes uh, with the, uh, the Vaynerchuk Media Group. Um, and also, you know, after hearing you speak again on the show, I, I've actually got on my nightstand why marketing works. So I'm excited to, uh, to tuck in for the evening and maybe, uh, yeah, but in a few chapters inside, I'm sure there's just an Archie comic hiding in there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little more risque than Archie. Oh yeah. Okay. I wasn't going to go. <laughs> no swearing, but we can make terribly crass jokes. Uh, anyways, Jeff, you know, I really appreciate it. You've, you've been with us for a few extra minutes over, uh, over the hour. Um, and I hope you don't mind just a few more extra minutes. Uh, something we like to do as we end the show, uh, is kind of transition away. We've talked about, you know, uh, professional life, career, uh, uh, client service organizations that we've worked with. Um, and I, I always think that, uh, if there's one thing I hope that gets, uh, wrapped into our conceptions of working life. Uh, in the future with, uh, you know, increasing uh, uh, candor is um, our humanity um, and the way that we are and the things that we do and our personality outside of work and beyond career. So I'd like to take a minute to ask you outside of career, outside of work, when it's Jeff on the weekend, um, you know, it's Friday today, 
what are you up to for the weekend? What do you like to do? What are your hobbies when, when you're not worried about the bills and, and your job? What yeah, your yeah that's great. So you're talking about therapy, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, luckily I live with a nurse and psychotherapist, so I've had that built in. My wife, uh, if I had to pay her for every hour of counseling, it would be bad. I guess it would be going into the same joint bank account. But no, it's been nice to have uh, my wife built in for support because she's fantastic. But my activities um, are writing and reading, but that's not what I do in the weekend. I live in Mont Tremblant now. I, I, I don't know why I was a prairie boy because I really love the topography of the Laurentians. I'm not a sort of, you know, you were out west for many years. Yeah. You know, I love the big mountains, but I, I love these rolling hills more. And we know that, you know, Tremblant is not a gigantic mountain. And I probably hiked it, I don't know, seven, eight hundred times, but there's so many other hikes in the area. So the weekend for me, and weekdays, because I can carve out my own time, is to be in the woods. And it's all uh, four seasons. I do it all the time. I hate snowshoeing. Uh, I like going on trails where they've already clamped it down. I just love putting on my boots and going. But uh, boy, am I a summer, fall, and spring explorer. There's so many neat trails here. There's a crashed World War II bomber on Black Mountain, which is neat to go up to. With the, the plane still sprawled up there and a, a very tasteful um, tribute to the, the servicemen who perished on the plane in 1943. Uh, the Laurentians are just gorgeous for that. And of course, there is the Quebec culture. I, I'm terrible, I'm un peu français. I'm glad they accept my uh, English here. Uh, but we have uh, a practice, cocktails it would be called in Manitoba, but here it's fun, they call it a, a cinq et set, a five to seven. Um, and they're really regimented about it. You know, it starts at five, uh, hosted by someone, uh, you have, uh, you know, an appetizer, but at seven o'clock, you're on your way home for your own dinner. And, mm -hmm. and so I kind of like that. You have your social thing, but then you have your own time. And we were doing that virtually. You know, we were doing our own Zoom versions of that. And now we're at a place, we've been so uh, compliant with, with the rules, especially because Quebec's been so hard hit. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we have a, have a stepdaughter in the area and we didn't see her for months. Like, and, you know, she's five minutes away. We, we were compliant. Um, so tonight we're going to our friend's uh, backyard and we will still be compliant at a distance, but it'll be nice to see them in person. Um, so that's sort of what's up for the weekend. Uh, and, and hiking to me has been great. I read a book uh, over this time called, this is called Walking, and I would totally recommend it to anyone, even if walking isn't your thing. It's just an amazingly well-written book by an explorer guy who loves to walk. I, I just identified him with it everywhere, but it's so philosophical and you can find yourself in it everywhere, especially at the time when we were in crisis, where it was, you know, one step at a time was literally the mantra. Yeah. And, and the book resonated so strongly. And, and I think it will continue to resonate. And, and it's going to be times like this uh, going forward. So when I go into the woods, yeah, sometimes I'm listening to a book on audio because I enjoy that. But I can just disappear into a trail. And, and all of a sudden, I, I, I reemerge myself and I've covered such distance in such time. Uh, that I'm amazed, and, and that's been my therapy. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I can definitely uh, resonate with that. I've been enjoying the walking lately. Uh, I think it's been one of the, the things that have been keeping us sane over here. So cool to know that you've got such an awesome backyard to enjoy it in uh, and that you're taking that time for yourself. So hats off, man. And, and I got really creative in the early days, too. I started doing walking Oh, stick. yeah. Yeah. So I, I saw these on Instagram, yeah. I've got the natural wood in there, and that I'm just fooling around, but this is wood I just find on trails. So some of it is decorative. It's kind of like those, you know, Hudson's Bay Company paddles you yeah, put up yeah. on the wall. But uh, I'm making some that are actual practical for the, the, the walking itself. Those are really cool. I think they might look a little bit out of place in uh, uh, dystopian Winnipeg uh, concrete yeah, walking think... trail, but... Uh... I, don't, I don't think you want to be at Portage in Maine with a stick. No. <laughs> Maybe up at the beach, though. Summertime in the beach, I bet those would fit right in. Nice work. Yeah. Those uh, those look awesome. And I've, I've heard a lot of people uh, uh, pining over them, actually. Uh, family members yeah. as well, saying those are really cool. So, uh, uh, I've been told I should sell them on Etsy, but we'll see. Yeah, well, uh, keep us posted, please, as uh, as fans and audience members of yours. Uh, if that happens, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be waiting. So... Yeah, I'd like to, to wrap things up and say a huge, huge thank you to Jeff for joining us today. Thanks for your extra little bit of time here at the back end. Thank you so much to all of the viewers online uh, at home uh, joining us today. 
Uh, and thank you to anybody who's, who watches this episode in the future as well. Um, and of course, we'd like to close off with a, a big thank you to our, our frontline workers and, and to everybody working so diligently to, to help deliver those essential services and keep us safe. Um, and uh, yeah, I really appreciate you joining us today, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. And anyone who's on or sees us subsequently and you just want to have a quick chat about anything, uh, Swiston Communications, and you can give me a call. Uh, the meter's not running all the time. Just would happy to have a chat. So I uh, look forward to anyone reaching out. Awesome. Awesome. Much appreciated. Thanks again, everybody at home. Stay safe and have an awesome Friday afternoon.